Okay, welcome back everybody to Emmanuel Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Lee and you're joining us for part six of Couch Church, Pray Like This, where we dig into the last part of Jesus' prayer. Now we know this as the Lord's Prayer. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here we're going to try to answer the question, why do we keep making the same mistakes over and over again? Uh, why do we keep doing those things that we know aren't good for us and we know aren't within the will of God? And the reality is we're going to learn today that good intentions aren't good enough. We need more than good intentions. We need deliverance. And so today we're going to learn how to break free, not necessarily from temptation. Temptation is always going to be there, but we're going to break free from those kind of bad patterns or bad cycles or bad traps that we tend to fall for that the evil one sets for us. And we're going to break free from falling into temptation and we are going to be delivered because of Jesus and what he's done for us. So thank you for joining us. If you've been here since part one, thank you for making it all the way through this series. Uh, if you've missed parts, you can go back and watch them. And I'm hoping that this will enrich your prayer life and how you relate to God and uh, how, how you realize that he's there for you, that you're not alone, that you are loved, and your life matters incredibly. Thanks for joining us for Couch Church today. Uh, I hope you get a lot out of it, and uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to lead you this far into the Lord's Prayer. Hi, my name is Mayumi, and this is the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A lot of you know that we have a resource that uh, we as Lutherans draw from, and it's called Luther's Small Catechism. In there, he talks about the Ten Commandments, and the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, and baptism, and communion, all these kinds of things. And in the Lord's Prayer, and in his teaching of the Lord's Prayer, he says this about uh, Jesus' prayer. He says, when Jesus prays, and lead us not into temptation, he says, what does this mean? He writes, God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. And then in the next phrase, Jesus prays, but deliver us from evil. Luther writes, what does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation, and finally, when our last hour comes, Give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. In this time of desperation, and all we know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And He's given us new life We believe the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death we believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again we believe so let our faith be more than anthems greater than the songs we sing our weakness and temptations we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus 
spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion So Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Matthew 6, verse 13. I have a question for you. Are you like me? Are you slow to learn from your mistakes? Are you like me? You keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Uh, There's a saying that says, I never make the same mistake twice. I make it three or four times, you know, just to make sure. Uh, Doesn't that feel like our lives a lot of the times? Doesn't it feel like sometimes we fall into the same temptation and sin? If this describes you, it can leave you feeling defeated, it can leave you feeling discouraged, and it can leave you feeling spiritually stuck. We tend to fall into these spiritual cycles sometimes, and it's a cycle that so many of us experience as human beings. Uh, we, here's how the cycle works. It starts with good intentions. Of course it does. And then it goes to temptation. Then we fall into sin. And then we feel this guilt and shame. And then we're driven back to God to seek God's grace and vow to do better. And then we repeat that cycle all over again. Uh, it won't come as a surprise to you if I said, you know what? God wants more for us in our life. God wants so much more. He wants us to be free from that cycle of uh, always uh, having good intentions and then falling away and then feeling this guilt and shame. And so the good news is that God has more for us. He promises more for us um, as we go through this time. Today, Jesus prays a prayer of deliverance, and he teaches us how to pray that prayer. Sometimes when we pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation, I think we falsely assume assume that God is somehow, you know, making sure that we don't fall into those uh, really bad, bad sins, you know, that we aren't enticed or alert into doing something really, really bad. Like, you know, we pray, lead us not into temptation, But the reality is the evil one, the enemy of our soul, is so much more deceitful than that. Uh, Not just tempting us to murder or commit adultery or disrespect our parents or commit grand theft auto, um, that kind of thing. But more often than not, most times we're tempted in subtle ways. Uh, A lot of other temptations come our way that aren't so big. And so if... If uh, any of these ring a bell for you, then you're not alone. You know, sometimes there's the temptation to do what works instead of doing what is right. Uh, There's the temptation to do what is easy, not necessarily the right thing, like, you know, giving our kids a bunch of candy to uh, keep them quiet. We know it's not the right thing to do, but it's the easy thing. Uh, The temptation to, you know... To, to what is going to work right now, to do what is going to work right now, rather than considering what is right and doing that now and in the long term. There's the temptation to do something self-serving, or there's the temptation to do unimportant things rather than what matters most. There's a temptation to do what is right, but for the wrong reasons. You see, temptation is much more subtle than we would think, and no one escapes this. The truth is, you know, if we never gave in to temptation, then the last two weeks of Pray Like This, the last two episodes of Couch Church, uh, you wouldn't need those things. You know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If we never fell into temptation, we would never need to ask for forgiveness, or we would never need to forgive those around us. So 
Uh, We really, really need this prayer of deliverance, don't we? Thankfully, our God knows all about this, and he has given us a way to address temptations in our lives. Thank goodness. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. All this to say, this problem isn't just yours. Uh, This is common to everyone. Temptation is common to everybody. Even your particular temptations aren't all that uh, unique to you. And the other thing that's in common is that God provides a way out, generally speaking, when we are tempted. So, You know, often when we are tempted and we fall into sin, we're convinced that there was no other option for us, that uh, we didn't have a way out when we fell into temptation. Yet God tells us there is a way out so that we don't fall into temptation. So there's some pretty straightforward things that uh, we learn from God's word about what we can do and keep in mind when we are tempted. Uh, You can first identify the things that make you particularly vulnerable or weak. Jesus said to his disciples at one particular moment that they were vulnerable. It was a vulnerable time for them and for Jesus himself. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, when we just try to power through it, when we try to rely solely on our willpower, uh, we know this. Our body is weak. Our mind is weak. Our will can be weak. And so Jesus says not just to pray, but he says watch and pray. Watch and pray. We want you to, we want to pray, but we also need to be watching. Well, what are we watching for when we're praying? We're watching for the circumstances that make us most vulnerable. The enemy of our soul, he knows us so well. He is like a custom tempter. He is a custom deceiver. And he knows how to get to us. He may even know our weakest spots more than we know them ourselves. And so he probably knows your weak spots and he probably knows mine too. Your vulnerabilities aren't the same as mine, and mine aren't the same as yours. Uh, Something where you're weak in, maybe I'm strong. And where you're strong, maybe I'm weak. And so you can't really look at your friends or your family or your church family and say, you know, look at them. Look, how, how do they fall into that every time? Why are they so weak in that area? That's not a problem for me. You know, we can't really say that. Why are they so tempted by this or that? It's not a big deal for me, so why is it a big deal for them? I think it's foolish or ignorant of us to think in this way. It's far better to recognize that we all have weaknesses and we all struggle with temptation. And we realize those around us have struggles too. So what are those things that make me particularly particularly vulnerable. We should be asking ourselves some questions as we watch and pray. You know, when? When am I most tempted? You know, maybe at certain times of the week, maybe at certain times of the day. Answer that question for yourself. When am I most tempted? Is it towards the end of the week or is it the beginning of the week? Is it morning? Is it midday? Is it after? Is it evening? When is it? Ask yourself, where am I most tempted? Where? Where am I most tempted? At the mall? At work? At the beach? At the bar? When you're on your phone? When you're on the computer? Uh, Maybe you're away on vacation. Maybe it's in a different city while you're doing business. Away from family or supportive friends. Where are you? How about you? Where are you when you fall into temptation? Who are you with when you're tempted? Uh, who are you with? Who's, who's with you? Who's with me? Am I alone? Am I with somebody? Is it with a certain group of friends and they're kind of uh, drawing me into 
a certain kind of trouble? Is it when you're with a crowd of strangers and no one knows who you are? Ask yourself, what is the benefit of falling into temptation? What is the payoff? What is the benefit of doing whatever it is you get tempted to do? What is the pleasure? What is the kick? Um, What do you get out of it? Because sin has some sort of pleasure or perceived benefit. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we looking for? Because our sinful nature will so often search for those things that can only truly be satisfied by God himself and having a relationship with him. So we need to be asking ourselves, what are we looking for? Sin has some sort of draw here. Ask yourself, what are we really looking for? Because sometimes when we fall in temptation, it is to uh, try to cover up a pain. Maybe we're looking for some confidence of some kind. Maybe we're trying to dull whatever it is that is going on around us. What is driving us towards that, right? And then there's another question. How do I feel right about the time when I'm being tempted? Feelings are important. Feelings are an indicator of something going on in our heart and in our mind uh, that might be like warning signs or on our dashboard of our car. Our feelings are real and they can be used against us. In fact, our enemy, the enemy of our soul, can use our feelings against us. You know, when we're feeling tempted, are we feeling anxious? Are we frustrated? Are we overloaded? Are we bored? If we don't figure out what our emotions are, know full well that your enemy, the enemy of your soul, will certainly identify those emotions that keep you vulnerable. Those emotions are warning bells, perhaps, uh, that temptation is not too far around the corner. Watch and pray. Watch and pray, Jesus says. We recognize those vulnerable spaces or places in our lives. The next thing we do is, well, what do you think is the next thing we do? What is the next thing we do? The next thing we do is make a plan. Make a plan to avoid the temptation. Make a plan when we are in those vulnerable places that we've recognized. Make a plan to avoid it. Lead me not into temptation, we pray. You know, financial advisors, they love this saying. They say, people don't plan to fail. People fail to plan. So like a financial plan, we need a spiritual plan when we're feeling attacked or when we're feeling uh, tempted. We need a plan. And if we don't have a plan, we're sort of like a sitting duck and we could get into trouble really, really quickly. We need a plan or a way to avoid temptation Proverbs 4, 25 to 27 says, Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Now that writer of Proverbs is making a plan. Look, uh, let your eyes look straight ahead. In terms of coming up with a plan to avoid temptation, it's important to think how we might avoid those areas of weakness for ourselves. Have a plan in advance. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything flows from it. Flows from what? Flows from your heart. At one point, Jesus was telling his disciples how important this was to guard their heart. And he said, you know, nothing outside a person can defile them by going in. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Mark 7, 15. Jesus says it's out of the person's heart that evil comes. It's the heart that's the issue here. Temptation doesn't just come from the outside. Uh, I I would say the trigger for the temptation might come from the outside, but then there's something that happens within us, in our heart. 
it's in our inner it's it's our inner desires that become the problem those things we try to achieve or that we want outside of the will of god it's what that is in our heart that gets attracted to the temptation kind of like a magnet a magnet by by its very nature picks up metal right uh, well, like a magnet, our heart is pulled towards what is tempting us. So, uh, like God's word says, we really need to protect our heart. It's what's in us that gets pulled towards whatever that sinful thing is. The falling into temptation starts inside of us. So, how do we guard our heart? Ask yourself, how's your heart? Is your heart healthy? Spiritually speaking, what's the spiritual health of your heart? Are you tired? Are you discouraged? Are you bored? Are you spiritually distancing yourselves from others? Are you insecure? Maybe you're feeling wounded or bitter or sad or lonely. Whatever it is, those conditions of our heart are often fertile ground for our enemy to do his work. Uh, Ephesians 4.26 warns us about this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let the devil get in there. Guard your heart. Anytime, <clears throat> anytime we carry around these things for too long, it gives the devil opportunity to get in there. Uh, if we hang on to anger or worry or fear, whatever it is, the longer you hold on to these things, the more easily the devil uh, gets a hold of these things to get in there uh, to do his work of deception and getting us to fall away from God. We give the enemy a spot to attack. We guard our heart and then we pray for deliverance. We go to God for help. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, God says. Go to God for help. And sometimes our prayer of deliverance can be just one word. I'm sure you've prayed this one word prayer before, and it goes like this. Help. That's it. That's your prayer of deliverance. The Bible's full of examples of God's people calling on God for help. Um, and he does, and he does help them. Maybe it's right before you head into a meeting that you're kind of really worried about how it's going to go. Or maybe it's uh, sitting down with a person you know you have to have this heart-to-heart -heart conversation with, and you would just as soon not meet with the person. Uh, you would actually like to wring their neck or something like that. And uh, you're just praying one word, God, help. It's a prayer of deliverance. God, guard me, help me, deliver me. You know, David, King David, uh, when he faced the giant Goliath, he prayed for deliverance and God delivered him. Daniel prayed for deliverance before going into the lion's den and the Lord delivered him. Peter prayed for deliverance when he was sinking in the water and the Lord took his hand. Paul prayed for deliverance when he prayed to be delivered from what he described as a thorn in the flesh and more than once he prayed for this deliverance, and he was given the grace to persevere. The Lord gives assistance to those who ask, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I don't have the strength. I don't have the willpower. I don't have the ability or the skills. God, deliver me. You see, God understands. Isn't it foolish of us to think that or assume that God doesn't or can't understand what we're going through scripture says we have a god who gets us more than we could ever know hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 to 16 says for we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so in prayer, we approach God with confidence. You see, Jesus was tempted in every way we are. Our temptations are so common that they are even common to Jesus. And because Jesus was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. 
And that allows us to go into his presence with confidence. That's why we know he will hear our prayer. The lie of the enemy would say, you know what? Don't bother God with that mistake again. The lie of the enemy would say, you know, if God finds out about this temptation and you falling in that temptation again that you're dealing with, he's going to send you away. He's not going to want to deal with you. But God says the opposite. Go to God with your weakness. Go to God with your temptation and he will help you. He knows. He doesn't want you to try to handle this on your own. Don't pretend that your problems don't exist. Don't cower in a corner and hide. God wants you to call on him. You know, so, so far, what have we learned from this one phrase? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So far, we've done all these things. We take stock of our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. We set up a plan to avoid them. We guard our heart. We call on God for deliverance. And then we turn. We turn our direction and our focus elsewhere. We don't just simply try to resist the temptation. We actually take time to reflect and refocus. Refocus is a great spiritual strategy. Uh, It's easy theoretically. Uh, It's harder when the temptation is right there in front of us. So try this. Don't resist. Refocus. It only makes sense, right? When you're, resistant, when you're resisting something, where is all your focus? It's on the thing you're trying to defeat, right? It's on the thing that you're trying to push away. Where's the attention? It's in the wrong place. Refocus on something else, on something better. Uh, you may have seen this before. There's a social uh, experiment uh, with children. It was called the marshmallow test. And uh, social scientists would be dealing with these kids in this experiment, and they would set a marshmallow in front of the child. And they would say, you know what? You can have this marshmallow now, or you could wait a little bit of time, and later you'll get two marshmallows if you don't eat this marshmallow right now. Uh, So the promise was if you can hold off here, you're going to get more later. Well, it was so fun or funny to watch these kids try and resist the temptation. Uh, Some would be looking around, you know, trying not to look at the marshmallow. Uh, Some would be intensely focused on the marshmallow. Some would pick up the marshmallow. They would touch it. Some would lick it a little bit and then put it back on the plate. Uh, it's, It's quite hilarious. You know, the more you try to resist the greater chance you have of losing the, big, the battle because your, your attention is in the wrong place. There's a saying, what we resist persists. And what we resist tends to persist. Isn't that true in our life? The Bible doesn't tell us to resist. The Bible doesn't say resist sexual immorality. The Bible doesn't say resist idolatry or resist the love of money or resist selfish desires. What does the Bible say? It says, flee, remove yourself from the situation. This is really important. Flee from all of these things. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee and refocus. Refocus on what? Well, thankfully, St. Paul gives Timothy some things to focus on. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord. Those things that are good, focus on those things. I'm going to refocus my attention on something else. You know, the things we tried so hard to resist then begin to lose their power and their pull. You know, when I'm driving or when I'm cycling, I tend to go where my eyes look, right? We tend to steer where we're looking. My chances of staying on the road increase dramatically by focusing ahead, and I tend to steer where I'm looking. So instead of resisting, try refocusing.
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So where are your eyes looking today? Where are you focused This is, you know, where we tend to look is where we uh, tend to be drawn to. So above all, after having done all the things that we've talked about today, fix your eyes on Jesus. Isn't it, after all, Christ's obedience that has delivered us from evil and the evil one? You know, when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Wasn't it Christ who was tempted not to go to the cross? Didn't Christ face the temptation not to do the right thing? It must have been an overwhelming temptation for him to take the easy way out and avoid the the cross altogether. To not do the hard thing and to do the easy thing and not go to the cross. The devil surely dangled this option in front of Jesus. Because we know in early in his ministry, after Jesus was baptized, Satan dangled food when Jesus was hungry. He dangled fame and popularity in front of Jesus when Jesus was being shunned and ostracized and judged and rejected. So Christ's obedience is what wins our deliverance and guarantees it. He wrestled with temptation in the desert and won. He wrestled with temptation in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified, and he won. Matthew 26, 39 says, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, won. He chose the Father's will, even when we would not. He submitted to the Father's will. He was obedient. Our deliverance from evil, from falling into temptation, is linked to obedience. Not our obedience, but to his obedience. So I think as we pray this prayer together, let's stop there for a moment. Let's refocus on Jesus once again, because we know that he promises to deliver us. We have the promise that he will deliver us from the evil one and you can trust in him. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this series, Pray Like This. Thanks for drawing us closer to you in prayer. You know all the habits and temptations in our lives. You know the challenging situations we're facing right now. Evil is all around us lurking. The opportunity to go our own way instead of yours is always there. Yet you tell us that there's a way out, Lord. Today, Lord, we're asking for your help. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. And you do. Thank you, Jesus. Help us recognize sinful patterns in our lives and help us avoid them. Focus our attention on something new, something good, something right, something life-giving. Help us focus on your son, Jesus. Help us connect with other Christians that can help us and that we can help them as they go through their journey. Uh, Thank you for the deliverance that you promise us. We receive your promises by faith. It's in your precious name, Jesus, we pray this. Amen. My name is Mayumi and this is the prayer that Jesus taught us. Um. <laughs>